I will now give a lecture on the defining principles of Marxist analysis of the world that we live in, show how it applies to our real lives, but the name of his philosophy, everything should have a name, is historical materialism, best understood by way of comparison to what I'll call physical materialism. Physical materialism would be the attitude of a physics professor, a natural scientist, studying the basic material, the basic matter of the physical universe, try to find the laws operating in nature, use your knowledge of these laws to do what scientists do, explain the past, how the past has become the present, Think of geology, explain the present, what time is going to be low tide today, predict the future, eclipses, and hopefully one day earthquakes. In a similar sense, Marx is a historical materialist, wanting to study the basic material, the basic matter of human history. Try to find the laws operating in human history. Use your knowledge of these laws to explain the past, how the past has become the present. Explain what's going on in the present. Predict the future. One of the first stimuluses to the idea that we should try to study society scientifically the same way we study nature scientifically. And when it comes time for Marx to decide what is the basic matter of human history, just like in physics, it's the structure of the atom around which everything revolves, from which everything can be explained. In human history, that role is played by the economics of the particular society called economic determinism. It is the economic system that a country has that determines the character of the society and the character of the people who live in that society. One of the ideas here, different types of economies give rise to different types of societies and different types of people. See here especially the communism lecture around minute 26. It is the economy, what you have to do to make your living and how you have to do it. That's the most important thing. In other words, your working life, that's the most important thing. After all, you can't avoid working much as you try. The alarm clock goes off in the morning. You say, damn, I don't want to have to get up and go to work today. But you do have to get up and go to work today. And I hope I'm not the first one to bring you the bad news. This is going to be true just about every day for the rest of your life. Working then, crucial for life. You can't avoid it. Although breathing is also crucial for life. The difference, of course, breathing is easy. Work takes up most of your time, most of your energy. Even today, if you only work eight hours a day, you're pretty lucky. 24 hours in a day, you're supposed to sleep eight hours a day. I know many of you don't sleep eight hours a day. You're too busy, but you are aware, of course, to whatever extent you try to get more hours in the day by sleeping less. You have less energy to use the hours that you have effectively. And so eight out of 16 hours, roughly half of our day, that's spent just at work doesn't count commuting to work, commuting home from work, stopping off at the dry cleaners, picking up your clothes, dropping clothes off, takes substantially more than half of our time main focus of life. I like to tell my students, you can walk in late a couple of days, you're tired, you work the night shift, you can put your head down and close your eyes for a while, miss a couple of classes. I understand. I try to teach everybody, and so I try to go slowly and repeat the main points. But when you're at work, try showing up late a couple of times, try letting the boss see you with your head down and your eyes closed a couple of times, try just not showing up a couple of times, see how long you have that job. Work takes up most of our time, most of our energy. It's the main focus of life, and so work economics shapes you. The usual metaphor that I accept economics determines the character of the society and the people in that society the same way a foundation determines the character of a building. 
what aspects of the character of a building are determined by the foundation, what aspects of the character of the building are not determined by the foundation, aspects of the character of the building that are determined by the foundation, the most important parts, how tall the building can be, how strong the building can be, what shape the building can be, what aspects of the character of the building are not determined by the foundation, the superficial details, what color we paint the walls, what kind of chairs they put for you to sit in, what kind of board they give for me to write in, the most important parts, character of the building height, shape, strength, they are determined by the foundation. The superficial details are not determined by the foundation. This brings me to what is perhaps the most important sentence in the philosophy of Karl Marx. It is not your consciousness that determines your existence. Rather, it is your social existence that determines your consciousness. Take that half at a time. It is not your consciousness that determines your existence. What would that mean if my consciousness could determine my existence? I remember I once had a guy say, if my consciousness could determine my existence, I would just determine that I should be able to fly, spread my arms, give them a flap, and away where I would go. All my life, the guy wrote, I've wanted to be able to fly. If my consciousness could determine my existence, I would consciously determine, just spread my arms, flap them, and away I go. Can't be done. And not just physically, but also spiritually. Spiritually, if your consciousness could determine the character of your existence, then you should be able to do something like the following and try this tomorrow morning. I've tried it many times through the course of my own life. When you wake up tomorrow morning, consciously determine that from now on your existence is going to have the character of being joyous and lighthearted and cheerful and carefree. And consciously determine that nothing is ever going to get you down or annoy you or irritate you to the slightest degree possible. Possible. Just consciously determine this. I've done it many times. I've tried it many times. Consciously determine from now on my life will have the character of being cheerful, joyous, lighthearted, and carefree. Nothing is ever going to get me down or irritate me or annoy me to the slightest degree. How long will that conscious determination last? Until you hit rush hour traffic in the morning? Your first boring and irrelevant lecture? Memorize and spit back type of exam? Would that life was so simple that our consciousness could determine the character of our existence? Existence. Rather, Marx says, it is your social existence that determines your consciousness, your social existence, the type of society you live in, that determines your consciousness, your character, your values, your personality, and what determines the type of society that you live in. It's called economic determinism. Economics determines the character of the society, and the character of the society determines the character of the people like you. For example, our economy is free enterprise called by Marx capitalism. They mean the same thing, by the way. Those with capital, those with money, own the businesses, both big and small. In socialism, see the socialism, part one and two lectures, as we see, it is the government that owns the big businesses, but in capitalism, those with capital can own all the businesses, big and small. We don't have traditional capitalism where the role of the government is to do nothing. Our government takes a fairly active role in monitoring and regulating our country's economy, but we retain the basic feature, the foundational feature of capitalism, in that everything revolves around competition. Companies compete for customers. Workers like you compete for jobs, compete for promotions. You will for the rest of your life. And so that's the economy. That's the foundation. Capitalism, competition everywhere. And so every other aspect of the building, every other aspect of the culture reflects the foundation and is also competitive. Where else in our society, other than the economy, do you also find competition where you might not always 
always find competition. Generally, as soon as I say the word competition, first answer was sports, of course, recreation, sports, extremely competitive. Brings me to that famous saying by that great American philosopher of sport, Vince Lombardi, coach of the original Super Bowl winning Green Bay Packers and the winner of the Super Bowl gets the Lombardi Trophy, famous for his saying, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. Brings me to my shirt in Aztec colors. And the shirt, by the way, was given to me many years ago by the person who at the time, I believe, was the leading scorer in all of Aztec's football history. He has since been surpassed by the great Marshall Falk, among others. And back then, the coach gave this shirt to every member of the football team. Friday, the day before the Saturday game, they would all walk around campus wearing this shirt. This student who member of the football team, leading scorer, gave me the shirt because he knew how much I would enjoy making fun of it even 25 years later. Whatever it takes, just win. Whatever it takes, just win. What was the coach telling them to do? Steroids? Cheating? And how many times? Have I had students come up to me after this lecture and tell me they could not imagine any reason to engage in athletic activity unless it was to beat another human being in a game and then run up to your vanquished opponent and yell at them, we're number one in your face. But can anyone think of any previous societies put substantial emphasis on athletics and athletic accomplishment, did not have anything like our modern notion of beating another human being and then humiliating your vanquished opponent? I'm thinking, of course, of the ancient Greeks, inventors of the original Olympic Games, the modern version of which is still with us. And when the ancient Greeks engaged in the athletic activities that comprised the original Olympic Games, they didn't do it in the modern spirit to see which country won the most gold medals. Would it be the United States? Would it be Russia? Would it be China? You could tell they weren't doing it for the glory of the country because they didn't wear uniforms that distinguished them by country, where the Athenians would wear blue and the Spartans would wear yellow nor were they doing it for the glory of the individual athlete. You could tell because the athletes didn't wear uniforms with their names on the back or where the uniform had a number and the spectators would have a scorecard so you could match the number with the name. In fact, of course, what kind of uniforms did they wear? Absolutely none. They engaged in these athletic activities completely in the nude and so unless you were pretty close to the action and knew the athlete pretty well, you didn't even necessarily know who you were watching. The reason, say, a great gymnast would go through their incredible routines, not so much in hopes of getting their face on the cover of a box of cereal, but to reflect glory on the gods, to show the gods were so great they could create creatures, human beings, that seemingly could hover in the air, even though they didn't have wings. But for us, of course, winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. Whatever it takes, just win. And here I will try to fill out the metaphor that the foundation determines the general shape of the building, but not what color you paint the walls. In Europe, they have the same foundation, the same economic system, government-monitored and regulated capitalism. European companies compete for customers. European workers compete for jobs, compete for promotions. That's the shape of their economic foundation, competition. So the, say, so the shape of their recreation is also the same, also competitive. You you can paint the walls different colors. You can compete at different things. In the United States, the main competitive sports baseball, basketball, football. In Europe, the main competitive sport, soccer, what they very stupidly call football. Our game where you pass it with your hands should be called football. Their game where you kick it around with your feet, not football, that's called soccer. But of course, very fanatic about their football. And not only is sports very competitive, 
education also can be very competitive, especially in classes that are graded on a curve, where those at the top of the class curve get the best grades, they get into the best graduate and professional schools, they get the best jobs, they make the most money, those more towards the bottom of the class curve, they don't get into such good graduate and professional schools, they won't get such good jobs, they won't make so much money, miss a class or two in a system like that, go to one of your classmates and ask to borrow no Notes, they're not going to want to share their notes with you. Of course, they won't just say, no, I'm in competition with you, I hope you fail. So they'll make some kind of excuse. I have to work two jobs to put myself through this place. I don't get home until two in the morning and I go right to sleep. My notes are in a wall safe. If you show up at two o'clock, I'll give you 15 minutes to look at them. And I remember when I was an undergraduate, my roommate was pre-med and is a doctor today. Let's just call him Dr. Bill. He was taking taking the usual required pre-med course on genetics, doing the usual required experiment on reproduction in fruit flies, because fruit flies reproduce so very, very rapidly, even in the course of just a 15-week semester, you can go through many, many generations of fruit fly, do a pretty substantial experiment in the genetics of a fruit fly. So about the seventh or eighth week of the semester, my roommate, Dr. Bill, goes into the genetics lab, check on the progress of his fruit fly experiment, opened up his locker. What did he see? someone had done to his jar of fruit flies, murdered them in cold blood. I believe you just have to take off the top, let the air in, killed his fruit flies, murdered them in cold blood. This is called lab sabotage. Happens often enough that it has a name. Just an attempt to get my roommate, Dr. Bill, a zero on that assignment, knock him down the class curve so other people, probably the perpetrator themselves, could pass him correspondingly one notch. Because you can imagine what would happen if my roommate, Dr. Bill, went to the genetics professor, said something like, you know, I went into the genetics lab last night, check on the progress of my fruit fly experiment. When I opened up my locker, I saw somebody had murdered my fruit flies. Just an attempt to get you to give me a zero on this assignment, so that will knock me from where you know I have been all semester, near the top of the class curve. Now you're going to give me a zero. That's going to knock me down. Other people, probably the perpetrator, will pass me. We can't have that. We can't encourage this, can we? So can we waive this fruit fly experiment and count all of my other assignments with more weight? Can I do a shorter experiment in the genetics of a fruit fly? Ask the genetics professor something like that. And what does the genetics professor say? No way, kid. The first thing you got to learn around here is to watch your fruit flies. That's lesson number one in the capitalist economic system. And I've spoken to students, it occurs to me, around final exams time, they're in the library, somebody steals their stuff. One of their classmates steals their stuff when they go to the bathroom, so they can study. And when I was at UCSD, students would go into the libraries and rip the most important pages out of the most important research materials, so they were the only ones who could study it, and nobody else could. Go to the professor, say, oh, the page was stolen. Professor will probably think you're the one who stole it. So. Recreation, very competitive. Education, while you're thinking of the next main answer, I always like to say, driving on the freeway, very competitive. Try to merge in. How does the person behind respond? Oh, sure, I'll slow down. Merge in, no problem. They don't share the road with you. These aren't cooperative communists. These are competitive capitalists. Try to merge in. They speed up and try to cut you off. If you get in anyway, they start to flip you off. Be happy if they don't start shooting at you. It's a dodge, eat, dodge war zone out there. Also, social and sexual relations can be very competitive. I remember again when I was an undergraduate, we lived in suites, three rooms, two guys in each room surrounding a common living room area. How could I ever forget the two guys in the room next to me, two pretty good looking guys I surmise named Doug and George. Outside their bedroom door on the bulletin board, they put up a piece of paper divided down the middle, Doug's name on one side, George his name on the other side. They called this their scoreboard, and that might have seemed to be a strange name. Neither of these guys played darts in the sweet lounge, nor did they participate in the dorm ping pong tournament. What they were keeping score of was their conquests of members of the female sex. 
treating female human beings as though they were a ball in some game where you got points from bouncing them across the floor and getting them into your bed. And when a man scores with a woman, when a man conquers a woman, where does he put the notch recording his conquest? How many times I had students say, in the belt. At San Diego State, the belt would have so many notches it would fall apart, the pants would fall down, even at State that wouldn't be acceptable. The notch goes in the bedpost. The notch goes in the bedpost. As soon as she gets up and leaves, you put another notch in the bedpost. And when a woman scores with a man, when a woman conquers a man, since in modern capitalism women are free to sexually exploit and abuse men, the same way that men have always been free to sexually exploit and abuse women, capitalists call this women's liberation. Leave it to capitalists to confuse mutual exploitation with real human liberation. But when a woman conquers a man, when a woman scores with a man, where does she put the notch recording her conquest? And every now and again I would have a student call out, in the lipstick case, I figured that students' parents probably were big fans of the old-time rocker Pat Benatar. Before I put another notch in my lipstick case, you better make sure you put me in my place. Hit me with your best shot, sings Pat Benatar, describing the capitalist female view of modern social and sexual relations. And so the economic system, the foundation capitalism, basic feature, competition, every other aspect of the culture reflects this and is also competitive. Recreation, education, driving on the freeways, social, sexual relations, looks, cars, clothes, everybody, everything, very competitive. You compete at different things. You can paint the walls different colors. You compete at different things. But everybody and everything, very competitive. And when it comes time for Marx to decide what is the main economic law that determines the character of the modern world. Sounds like this should be important. The main economic law determines the character of the modern world. It is the simple fact that as the Industrial Revolution has gone along in the past few hundred years, capitalism has developed as promised great productive technologies. You come up with a better machine, a little bit more efficient, take a little bit off the cost, a little bit off the price, everybody buys from you, sets everybody off on a mad scramble. Get the best machine, make a lot of money. Look what's happened over the course of time. We have developed great productive technologies that we can see all around us. But the fact of the matter is these great productive technologies cost a lot of money to buy and own costs a lot of money to buy and own factories, buy all the machines to put inside the factory, pay all of the workers to run those machines. You don't own any factories and assembly lines. You don't even know anybody who does. Takes a lot of money to buy and own energy companies with their oil wells, nuclear power plants, transmission lines, power plants. Only the very wealthy can afford to own energy companies. There are no mom and pop energy companies. Only very wealthy people can afford to own big banks with their banks of computers, mines with all of their mining equipment, get it to the remote regions of the world where the minerals are found. These few, those who are wealthy enough to afford to own factories, energy companies, mines, banks, they will control the country's economy. They they will make even more money, and pretty much everybody else is going to go to work for them. Where are you going to work if not for one of the main corporations? And under pressure of competition, wages will be minimal, safety conditions non-existent. The capitalist owners will pay minimal wages, not because they are mean and nasty and don't care if their workers suffer. It is never appropriate, according to the doctrine of economic determinism, to explain things in terms of human quality qualities, like whether your boss is mean and nasty, or whether or not your boss is kind and generous. That really has nothing to do with it. It's the economic law of competition. In order to keep 
down the price to attract the customer, the boss has to keep down cost. And a major factor involved in cost is what you pay your help. So the same competitive forces that make them charge low prices, I like that when I'm a consumer, make them pay low wages. I don't like that when I'm a worker. And you can see exactly how this works if you have a job today that is the equivalent of working at a sweatshop in England during the Industrial Revolution. Say you work at McDonald's. Go to your boss at McDonald's and say something like, you know, boss, I work much harder than anybody else I know, and I make much less money than anybody else I know, and I don't think that's right, and I don't think that's fair, and I think I deserve a raise. What do you say? What did the boss say? I agree with you. To my experience in life, that's the best way to begin denying somebody something. Start by agreeing with them. I agree with you, the boss should say. You're a great worker. I'd love to give you a raise. And not just you, by the way. All of you are excellent workers. I'd love to give you all a raise. But if I do, what's going to happen? I'll be raising my cost pretty substantially. If I maintain my profit margin by raising my price, consumer will go elsewhere. And I'll wind up out of business, and you'll wind up losing your job. If I give you a raise and raise my cost and don't raise my price, now I have less money and I need my money to upgrade my technology. I'll get behind my competition, I'll go out of business, and you'll wind up losing your jobs anyway. And so, especially if the boss has already not been doing well against the competition and is being threatened with bankruptcy, instead of getting a raise, the boss is going to turn around and ask you to do what? Take a pay cut. And I always like to say, especially when I was teaching this in the 80s, we can see this many places. It's continued, by the way, through the American economy. Take the example of the American automobile industry. In the 1970s, as I recall, virtually all the cars on American roads were made in the United States, except, of course, for the mighty Volkswagen Beetle. Then all of a sudden, American automakers came under intense pressure of competition from Japanese auto makers because Japanese auto workers were paid an awful lot less than American auto workers. And so the Japanese had lower labor costs. They compensated by having a cheaper price. When they shipped those cars to America, Americans, Californians in particular, were buying the cheaper Japanese-made cars in great numbers. And it looked like if that trend continued, the American automakers were going to go bankrupt and the American auto workers were going to lose their jobs. And so the American auto makers said to the American auto workers that they had to take a voluntary pay cut so that the American auto makers could lower their costs, lower their price, compete with the Japanese. Otherwise, they told the workers, we're going broke and you're losing your job. The American auto workers did see the economic logic there. They did voluntarily take a pay cut, and then the automakers started opening up factories in Korea. Hyundai and Daewoo, Korean auto workers made even less than Japanese auto workers, so the Korean Automakers could hit the American market with cars of comparable quality. They're all made by pretty much the same machines. Had a cheaper price tag reflecting their cheaper labor costs. This put downward pressure on the wages of American and Japanese auto workers. And lately I've been reading they are thinking of opening up their auto making plants in Mexico, right across the border. The Maquila Daughters, Mexican auto workers, will make even less than Korean auto workers. This will put downward pressure on the wages of American, Japanese, and Korean auto workers. And every time I have given this lecture, I feel very pleased to be able to note, I sure am glad they can ship my job overseas to be done by cheap foreign labor, to be done by foreign philosophy professors, because I have often suspected, I have long suspected, every job that can be shipped overseas to be done by cheap foreign labor will be shipped overseas to be done by cheap foreign labor. And when they send our jobs overseas to be done by cheap foreign labor, 
It's not because they are unpatriotic and don't care if American workers lose their jobs. Again, this is economic determinism. It has nothing to do with patriotic or unpatriotic. It has only to do with the law of competition. As soon as one company goes overseas to take advantage of cheap foreign labor, all companies have to go overseas to take advantage of cheap foreign labor. Any company that won't, oh, I'm staying in America, I'm paying American workers higher wages, I'll have a higher price tag. That company's going to go bankrupt. The consumer will buy the cheaper import. The consumer won't even notice that it's imported. If they do notice that it's imported, they won't care. I only care about the cheaper price tag. The American company then will go out of business and the American workers will lose their jobs. Wages will be minimal. Safety conditions non-existent. Bosses can't spend money on safety for the workers. They have to spend money upgrading their technologies. And these new technologies, these new machines, when the bosses introduce the new machines, how do the workers respond? Oh, hooray, hooray, new machines, they'll do the job, we don't have to work so hard, off to the beach I go. The only reason they would have to go to the beach is to catch some fish, because that might be the only food they can afford. When the bosses bring in the new machines, these, of course, will replace the workers, the workers will lose their jobs, be out on the streets with their families, homeless, hungry and cold. And so when the workers bring in the new machines, what do the workers try to do to the new machines so they won't, won't lose their jobs? Smash the new machines. The name for that is a Luddite, L-U-D-D-I-T-E, a Luddite. Look it up in the dictionary. It will mean somebody who is against progress, like somebody who is against the use of instant replay in baseball. But as far as the workers were concerned, these new machines were in progress. It was a threat to their jobs and a threat to their lives when the bosses bring in the new machines, break the new machines. And so Marx thought capitalism would evolve a small class of rich owners, those few who can afford to own factories, energy companies, mines, and banks. Everybody else will work for them. Where else are you going to work? Under pressure of competition. Keep down the price. Keep down wages. The workers will be poor. A few people who are very rich, everybody else very poor. This is why Marx pre predicts the future will bring a revolution. The poor will rise up, try to redistribute the wealth from the rich to the poor, try to redistribute the power from the rich to the poor. And I will now proceed to try to show how this applies to the world that we live in today, that even in the United States we do have a small class of rich owners. You'll see these in the socialism lectures, but the richest 1% of American families control nearly 40% of the country's wealth. I looked that up yesterday, by the way, and that's still just about true. The richest 1% of American families own 40% of the wealth. Roughly the richest 2% own half. The richest 5% own 77%. The richest 10% own 90%. I think I also read that the richest 1% have more wealth than the bottom 90%. With this wealth, that gives them control of the government. In our so-called democracy, running for office costs so much money, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars, not coming from me and you, coming from these rich people put up the money for all the campaigns. And I remember back in 1981, I got this from the faculty association. We put money into political campaigns and thus exert power in Sacramento. I'm a logic teacher, so I like the and thus. We put money into political campaigns and thus exert power. It continues. The California State Employees Association will be the dominant employee union, displaying the kind of clout from its heavy financing of state legislative campaigns. I saw the logic there. I joined the union. I've already mentioned they had so much clout in Sacramento. Man, do I have a fat retirement, so thank them for that. And this one, an article in the Union Tribune some time ago from a fellow who signs his name Robert W. Thornburg, chairman of the San Diego County Republican Party. 
the San Diego County Republican Party. The longer I am involved in the political process, the more concerned I become with the huge sums of money that now seem to be necessary to conduct a campaign, even in the primary, actually especially in the primary, actually especially before the primary, before you can appear before the American people to appeal to the American people for money and support, you have to have money to make the appearance. Time on television, space in newspapers, advertising, and so forth. Only people who are rich or who sell out to the rich can get that kind of money. This one from the Union Tribune. U.S. Senate, a rich man's exclusive country club. A rich man's exclusive country club. And nowadays in the Senate, it isn't just rich men. Nowadays, we also have rich women. The capitalists call that diversity. It's not just rich men. It's also rich women. But it talks about the Ohio race, where Democratic Senator Howard Metzenbaum, a millionaire, was on the telephone last week reminding old friends who had forgotten to contribute to his campaign. Can you imagine how that conversation goes? I see you have forgotten to contribute to my campaign. If you continue to forget to contribute to my campaign, then if and when I get elected, what will I forget to do for you? I will forget to pass favorable legislation for you. In fact, what might I remember to do? I will remember to pass unfavorable legislation for you. I bet that gets their attention. Might have amnesia. His, Repub his challenger is Republican Senator St Paul Pfeiffer, whose net worth is less than Metzenbaum's annual income. Last week, Pfeiffer lost two days of Ohio campaign time traveling to Texas, so directors of corporate political committees there could interview him. And if the corporate political committees in Texas interview him and like what he says and they give him money and he takes it back to Ohio and runs and wins, who does he represent? The people of Ohio or the corporations in Texas? Texas. This one really tells you all you need to know. Legalized bribes. That's the way the Union Tribune refers to campaign donations. Couldn't have said it better. Legalized bribes. And this last piece I like very much from The Economist magazine, 13 Bankers, by Simon Johnson. Very significant. He is a former chief economist of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Big international banks give loans to developing countries. So he is one of the chief economists for the capitalists. I'm presenting this as a Marxist theme. He is one of the chief economists for the capitalists, The Economist magazine, very pro-capitalist magazine magazine. They mention, he says, Simon Johnson says, America's big banks act as an oligarchy, rule of the few, and the main big banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, they have assets of two and three quarter trillion dollars. Next is Wells Fargo. They have almost two trillion dollars. Bank of America, 2.38 trillion. Citibank, two trillion. Goldman Sachs, a trillion. Mo Morgan Stanley, a trillion dollars. These big banks, again, JP Morgan is the biggest. JP Morgan Chase is their full name, merged with Chase Manhattan, chairman of Chase Manhattan for many years. David Rockefeller. The Rockefellers also started Exxon. I'm just trying to explain my shirt. I've often called these Rocky and his friends. David Rockefeller, chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank. The Rockefellers started Exxon. Now Exxon Mobil. Rocky and his friends. Don't forget the friends, though. Very important to have friends. These big banks act as an oligarchy, a group that has gained political power because of its economic power. They got the money make the campaign contributions that gets them the government elected that they want, and then they use the political power for their own benefit. Lower taxes on them, less regulation for them. And so the small class of elite rich 
owns and controls the economy, gives the money to elect the government, government runs the schools, everything you learned in your life, the rich control the media, freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one, your access to information about what's going on in the world, they control pretty much everything of significance around here, lock, stock, and barrel. And everybody else will work for them under pressure of competition, keep down price, keep down costs, keep down wages, workers will be poor, but you folks don't look poor to me, you're watching this on a computer or a smartphone, you don't look poor to me, we are very well off, we have a substantial middle class here, which Marx thought was impossible, Marx thought there could only be the extremes, the few rich who could afford to own and control, factories, energy companies, mines, banks, and so forth, everybody else works for them to attract the customer, keep down price, keep down costs, keep down wages, everyone will be poor, but you're not poor, you're well off, we have a substantial middle class, so Marx seems to have been wrong here. But why was he wrong here? How have we been able to develop such a substantial middle class? Depends on who you believe. And so, as John Stuart Mill would desire to look at it from both points of view, according to the defenders of the capitalist system, and this is probably what you are most familiar with, since this is a capitalist country, and I point out they control pretty much everything around here, the reason we are so wealthy according to the defenders of capitalism is capitalism itself. We have embraced the glorious free enterprise economic system, don't forget to use the word glorious, underline it two times, plugged it into our country's economy, watched it do exactly what the defenders Adam Smith promised it would do, spew forth massive quantities of high quality low priced goods, give people great incentive to develop a better technology, you'll become a millionaire otherwise you'll go bankrupt. Look what's happened. We've developed these great productive technologies. We have developed machines, do the job quickly, make us wealthy. We have developed modern industry, does the job efficiently, makes us wealthy. Obviously a lot of truth to this. I want to say that again so you know I'm not joking. Obviously a lot of truth to this. So our enemies Marx here agrees to a point, yes, you, the Western world, the United States and Europe, you were the first ones to embrace free enterprise and develop modern industry. That's just an indisputable historical fact. Western Europe, the United States, first ones to embrace free enterprise, develop modern industry. But then where the defenders want to say develop machines produce quickly, modern industry produces efficiently, the enemies, Marx and so forth, wants to say yes, you developed machines machines that produced quickly made you wealthy, but with that you also developed machine guns. Shoot quickly, make you unbeatable at war. You developed modern industry, made things out of iron and steel, so Western Europe, the United States, first ones to develop heavy weaponry, make weapons out of iron and steel, cannons, tanks, later airplanes. Take these weapons, machine guns, cannons, tanks, to the places that do not have them yet, the giant continents, Asia, Africa, South America. Use your modern weapons, your machine guns, your cannons, your tanks to kill any local patriot, any Asian, African, or South American who has the nerve to try to resist your conquering their land. Use your machine guns, your cannons, your tanks to kill them. What chance will they stand against a machine gun? If they're using spears or bows and arrows, the end of one of my favorite movies, The Last Samurai, the samurai get pissed off that the government in Tokyo is selling out to the Western powers. The samurai march on Tokyo to overthrow the government of Tokyo. Unknown to the samurai, the government of Tokyo has gotten some pretty primitive machine guns from their allies in the Western world. And there's a scene of great drama. The samurai are charging the army of the government of Tokyo. They can't even figure out how to use the machine guns, and the samurai are getting close. Will they overrun the army of the government of Tokyo and win? But just at the last minute, the army of the government of Tokyo figures out how to get those machine guns cooking, and those samurai go down like a bunch of flies in a cloud of poison. You can be the greatest warrior the world has ever seen, a Japanese samurai, but when you come up against a machine gun, you don't have a snowball's chance in hell. Take your machine guns, your cannons, your tanks, 
links to Asia, Africa, South America. Kill anyone who gets in your way. Conquer Asia, conquer Africa, conquer South America. Dominate them, colonize them, exploit them. The true name of colonialism, as we Americans, a former British colony ourselves, must surely realize. What did the British do to us when we were the colony? Tax, tax, tax the daylights out of the colony, steal everything they got until they scream. So it should come as no surprise to anyone. Our enemies note, when the few who did all of that stealing Western Europe and the United States, they will be rich and happy. That's me. That's us. I'm very rich. I'm very happy. The system works. It works for me, but pretty much everybody else in the former colonies, Asia, Africa, South America, those places still have tremendous amounts of very poor people. And redistributing the wealth from the rich to the poor, redistributing the power from the rich to the poor, always a much more popular idea in those poor places than ever it was in this rich place. And so the next lecture should be the lecture on Iran. Maybe I've been corrected. I should call it Iran. First example, not the last, but the first example of how even the United States has gotten rich by stealing oil from the Middle East. After Iran, Socialism Part 1, Socialism Part 2, Communism, War Communism. Have a good day. Thank you.